time to sit down in my seat. Uh, we've got Andrew. Austerity measures have destroyed the hopes and dreams of Europe. They have destroyed the livelihoods of many. They have taken away jobs for thousands of people and pushed countless more deeper into poverty. And the only way to save Europe is to abandon austerity. But first, what are austerity measures? They are policies that are imposed on governments to reduce its budget deficits during a recession. These can include spending cuts, increasing taxes, and selling off of government assets. We see austerity has two main aims. First of all, secure and get more, greater financial resources for the government to spend, as well as to ensure greater political commitment to clean up the government's financial mess and ensure it does not contaminate the rest of the European Sea. We see that currently in Europe, austerity measures have been traditionally imposed by the Troika, made the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. And they are often imposing these austerity measures and deciding which sector to be cut. Furthermore, we see that the track record, the IMF of austerity, has not been very good. When they implemented it during the Asian financial crisis, as you to countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand suffering from devastated economies as a result. But in the context of Europe, we see that the spending cuts are often from sectors that are vital and essentially important for societal to function, and they are furthermore the easiest to be cut. Such sectors include the healthcare sector, the education, transportation, or even pension for elderly. We see austerity measures have failed to deliver economic recovery even after multiple rounds. Portugal implemented it four times, Greece seven times. And ironically, these countries have seen greater economic recession, with Portugal going through deep recessions of negative 4% economic growth in 2013. We see that even for Latvia, the most successful case study for austerity, we question its effectiveness as currently they are undergoing long-term economic problems and social unrest as a result of austerity. Furthermore, we on side proposition, we believe that the specific austerity measures imposed on Europe over the past decade have been badly conceived and implemented, and that they are counterproductive to economic recovery and instead cause greater harm to Europe. So we do not stand for the top-down approach of austerity, instead we rather a wide range of tools, we rather, we rather a wide range of policies that can be used wherever necessary. For example, one, we, we want to strengthen regulatory controls. Second of all, regulating financial conditions for the issuing of debts. Third, you could renegotiate the positions of European member states, the European Central Bank. And today we are going to prove to you that we are the side that best benefits the economy of the country, both in the long term and in the short term. And we are the side that best protects the weakest and most vulnerable people in society, and we provide the best solution for current European conditions. Opposition has to show us empirically how austerity after failing multiple times is still good for Europe in the short term and in the long term. And we bring it to you in our three main arguments. I'll be talking about how austerity is currently a wrong diagnosis and worsens the problem currently. Second of all, how austerity is immoral. And my second speaker, we're talking to you about how austerity makes present situations worse and as a result, harms future economic growth. On my first argument, about how currently austerity measures are simply the wrong method to do so. Let's talk about the European crisis and the user crisis and how this thing came about. This, the user crisis was 20 years in the making. It was came up from irrational exuberance by governments and private investors who intended to earn profits through increased borrowing and increased spending. As a result, this actually led to lax regulation, which facilitated the one-time borrowing and one-time lending. Furthermore, we see that these economies experienced bubbles, which eventually burst, and banks, the biggest player in these unregulated markets, eventually failed. And governments were forced to assume the role of lender of last resort, I'll take it a minute, sir, to bail out these banks to prevent destabilization, destabilization in Europe. But if I move on, yes, sir. Yes, sir, we agree. Maybe regulation might be a useful solution, but up until now, the harm has already been done. How are you going to solve the harms that we have today through excessive government spending? So, as I already mentioned, characterized earlier, that the current reason why Europe is currently in a situation is due to the bailout of the banks that failed in the first place. And furthermore, as I already mentioned, our policies best solve the crisis at this current point of time 
because we best ensure that Europe is able to recover based on our <laughs> solutions. So we back to my argument. So when these banks were bailed out, but however, due to the complexity of the banking institutions, as well as the nature of such debts, the governments were sucked deeper into a financial black hole with no end in sight. Furthermore, this actually demonstrated that the fiscal mismanagement by the government was actually due to them reacting to the failure of the banks, and instead, they could not actually focus on productive growth policies. So do, does austerity work in this case? Evidently not. Hence, it actually demonstrates that it's really a mismatch of solutions, and instead, we have to move away from austerity. But worst of all, austerity actually makes the conditions even worse. Because assuming austerity works, when nations have more sufficient resources, what happens now is that austerity frees up more resources and they continue to bail out these banks over and over and over and they actually they see that this is the most pressing issue currently at hand. And furthermore, this ensures that unsustainable and even failing banks are currently continue to exist and continue to harm society even further. Which is why, on comparative, we have to abandon austerity measures in order to ensure that we are able to tackle the root cause of the problem and ensure that nation can finally recover and have healthy liquidity and ensure it recovers in the long term with better investments. We give an example of Sanstander, a financial institution in Spain that actually engaged in risky lending and borrowing, which actually led to them having to be bailed by the Spanish banks, eventually draining their budget and causing the Spanish financial crisis in the end. On my second argument about how it's immoral, I'm going to talk about the three stakeholders in this argument. First of all, how it harms the international arena and its present government, and finally, internet individual states. On the first point about high harm to the international arena, currently we see that austerity measures are decided and created by small groups of bureaucrats, we have the ECB and the IMF, who are left to decide the fate of millions of people and nations and such which sectors to be cut. And in order furthermore, they're under heavy pressures by lender companies like Germany, who are pressurizing companies to actually ensure that the debt is paid quickly. Furthermore, the method they assume that Europe is homogenous, that all social economic conditions are currently the same in Europe, and hence the policies does not work in such a case. Furthermore, this blunt tool over Europe is forced onto people who have no choice but accept it, as austerity is now the conditions for the bailout. As a result, this lacks the mandate of the people and support of local governments. And what happens? This violates the right and sovereignty for its government to control its own economic policies. And on the ground, what does this mean? This actually means that the government cannot effectively solve and tailor solutions to solve the root cause of the problem, and hence the problem still lingers with society. And on my second point about how essentially it's immoral in terms of the present government. We see that the current user crisis was caused by irresponsible governments based on the past and currently has no link to present governments or even present society. Hence, it's immoral and unjustified to pin the blame on the present society who had nothing to do with the problem. Furthermore, you're not cutting down the essential services that they require. Essential services such as your pensions, your welfare state, as well as your mental protection for citizens, even your most vulnerable people with the society to suffer as a result. So in a comparative, when actually you abandon austerity measures, you actually ensure that people in society are protected as a result because such areas are not cut on the process. On a final point, it's essentially about how it's immoral for individual European states. We just talk about the European crisis. Essentially, it's a made of collective nations all pulling together their financial risk and resources at the end of the day. However, what happens? During times of economic downturn, they alter the real politics, where they're fighting for their own rights and their own interests, affecting other nations, and the blame is not shared equally, and hence actually destroys any form of cooperation in Europe as a whole. And because austerity perpetuates poverty, and the only way to prosperity is to abandon austerity. I thank the speaker for his speech. And just a quick reminder to all the speakers that if you're offering points of information, please use the mics on your table, just to make it easier to hear. So we could hear in that case, but just for, for the audience. Um, so without further ado, can I call on the first speaker for the opposition side from Team Vampires, uh, Can We Get Arena? We are not here to defend the negative aspects of the status quo. We are not here to defend badly implemented austerity measures. We are here to defend the principle behind austerity measures. We are here to defend the correct implementation of austerity measures. We are here to defend the model of Finland, Sweden, Germany, not what has happened in Greece and the wrong implementation of those measures. Team Vampires today will tell you two essential things. You will hear this principle all throughout our speeches. First of all, that the current context of Europe right now doesn't offer us an alternative. And second of all, that in principle, austerity is justified. 
because besides the fact that it means budget cuts, it also means discipline. It also means eliminating excessive, unnecessary spending that the governments in Europe have been uh, doing so far. Before I go on to constructive, which will consist in firstly, why the context requires this, and second of all, why it is a viable solution if implemented correctly, I will have two main points of rebuttal. First of all, Andrew has been, no, thank you, has been telling us about the fact that austerity measures are wrong. And they've been blaming the current context in Europe on banks. They've been trying to tell us that wrong negotiations made essentially by banks are the reason why we have crisis in Europe. And I have three responses to this. Firstly, that's a huge speculation. When we're talking about Greece, saying that banks are to blame for a country in which corruption is sky high, which tax evasion is extremely popular, in which the 2004 Olympics have been the biggest example of theft in terms of corruption, then saying that banks are to blame for this is, no thank you, extremely false. Second of all, we tell you that banks also lend to countries like Germany, yet we don't see this happening in countries which are able to probably negotiate their deals. Second of all, we tell you that what they're proposing is not mutually exclusive. You can introduce better financial transparency and better negotiating in terms of these countries with banks and implement some kind of discipline in terms, no thank you sir, historic austerity measures. We are defending transparency, we are defending responsibility in terms of negotiating your bailout, but that doesn't mean that you have to be free to continue to spend excessively. And third of all, if we look at what this actually means, better negotiating, we also have to look at the perspective of countries like Spain, Greece, and Portugal. How are, you, how are you going to look like you are trustworthy to your creditors if you continue to spend? The only way to strike better deals, no thank you sir, with your creditors is to show them that you are ready to pay your debt, that you are ready to cut down on your spending in order for you to convince them to continue to lend you in the future. Second point of rebuttal has been about this whole democratic argument as to how it is immoral for small institutions to impose austerity measures uh, on countries in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about a European Union, an economic union, in which countries received bailouts for fi from financial institutions. It's absolutely naive to say that they have no right to impose anything on these countries, because when these countries get the money to save their own economies, they are willingly accepting the fact they have responsibility. Any contract bears, no thank you, obligations on both sides. So they do have a right to impose something because they give something back, which is money. Money that needs to be spent rationally because it comes from creditors that needs to be repaid. Now moving on to constructive. First of all, why the current context requires such measures and we simply do not have an alternative. We also urge team proposition to actually present us an alternative to uh, reduce the budget deficit because they haven't given us so far. No, thank you. Up until this point in the debate, you still don't know what team proposition wants to do. We urge the next speaker to do something about it. But on, from my point of view, we believe that the budget deficit is an extremely problematic situation. It's a situation in which your spending exceeds your revenues. You are simply unable as a country to cover all of the spending that you have to do. So what happens is you get loans from international creditors, such as the IMF, such as the European Central Bank, and you keep borrowing your thing. For example, in Greece, 78% of the debt is earned to public institutions like the European Central Bank, like the IMF. Also to other countries like Germany, which lend money to these countries. Now what happens is that if you keep borrowing, if you receive bailout after bailout, and you are unable to pay that debt, you will reach a situation in which your creditors demand higher interest rates in order to cover their potential losses, in order to make sure that they are able to receive their money back. If I let Sonia know, thank you, $5, and she doesn't pay it back, the next time she'll ask for money, I'm going to require a higher interest rate. Furthermore, if she doesn't pay it back, I will be less willing to uh, give her an extra loan. This is precisely what happens to these countries. Constant borrowing without reduction of spending leaves this country in a situation in which they are unable to pay it back simply because their creditors re uh, require higher and higher interest okay. rates. No, thank you, sir. Moving on to the second point about why this is a viable solution, but it's been implemented wrongly. Now, if we follow team proposition definition, which is that austerity requires uh, budget cuts, we believe that 
eight out of the 30 countries that allegedly implemented these austerity measures have not implemented budget cuts. Greece ex ex increased its governmental spending by 8%, Spain by 13%, Portugal by 6%. This is not how austerity is supposed to work. If we look at Greece and deem it as a failure, that's because Greece has actually implemented austerity measure. No, thank you, sir. In the true sense of that word. Now, let's look at Latvia and all of the other countries that have properly implemented these austerity measures. Latvia implements austerity measures, and in 18 months, it's already begun to register a growth of 5.5%. And how did Latvia do this? First of all, it reduces governmental expenditure by 8%. No, thank you. Second of all, it hit bureaucracy. It reduced the number of state agencies which performed unnecessary roles in the state. Third of all, it reduced the wages of ministers, the most wealthy politician in the countries, while pensions and welfare were barely reduced, therefore protecting the well-being of the people that would have been most affected and targeting the real problem. No, thank you, sir. Now, if we, look at, if we look at Latvia and Greece, these are the two most hit countries by the crisis in Europe. Latvia fired 30% of the civil servants. What did Greece do? Hire 5,000 more. Now, if we look at these results, you will see that Latvia received more funds than Greece, more trust from its creditors, more of, it has a bigger prospect of returning those money, precisely because it applied a correct principle that hasn't been applied in the countries like Portugal, Spain, and Greece. Now, because Team Vampires is telling you today that austerity is justified if implemented correctly, and that in the current status quo, we don't have an alternative, and that Team Singapore hasn't presented us with any viable solution whatsoever, we believe austerity should be kept. Thank you. to the speaker for his speech. We shall now call on the second speaker from the team from ACJC Terminators. Uh, we have Esther. Because some 
something like this, something like austerity measures, can never be fully committed to in a political arena or with governments. It's just something we can't stand for. Because in this scenario, when it's a top-down approach from external organizations imposing something onto the governments that have already had their own thoughts, when you have this top-down approach, nothing really changes in the economy. Essentially, you only limit them for a short period of time, and the problem only continually grows worse. Therefore, their point works to our side, improving you that these viable solutions ha never have found a way to be implemented properly just because austerity, austerity measures in and of itself are problematic from the very start. So on the second point on how there's no more alternative in which they showed us countries will continue borrowing, the, uh, borrowing money and without making money back, therefore falling back deeper into a crisis, we told you from the very start, it's not a problem with the government being recklessly spending. The main problem of most of the cases with countries needing to seek austerity measures were mainly because they had other problems, such as having to bail out banks that were mainly the ones that were reckless in spending and giving out loans. Therefore, they were the ones that provided the black hole for these governments to fall into. Therefore, it's not really a problem that they're tackling in the first place. Their policies don't hit the root of the problem in the very start. They've never highlighted the heart of the crisis in the first place. And anyway, we don't want to do it your way in any scenario because in the first place, you're hitting a group of people, the most uh, vulnerable in society, and that is what we don't want to do on your side because when you only implement austerity, you harm the most innocent civilians on the ground. These people that will get the essential services cut, these people had never actually caused the crisis to occur in the first place. Therefore, your solution doesn't solve anything. But before I move on, yes, madam. Could you please tackle the examples of Germany, for example, that hasn't been targeting the wrong number of people? To that we say Germany has been targeting the wrong group of people because when they have gone through these recessions or the crisis that you're talking about, we're telling you that what they do in their austerity measures that they implement is already going to harm the people on the ground the most. Therefore, on your side, the examples that you give up still present to us a government that has been unable to implement austerity measures that benefit everyone or even target the real root of the problem, therefore not improving anything. And on the point on our side, when we gave you the point on immorality, They've never actually come back to us on the three tiers we gave you, on the three audience members that are really going to be involved in this scenario, on how it harms the international sphere, on how it harms individual states, and how it's immoral to hold individuals accountable for something that they never caused in the first place. To that, they never rebutted that, conceding to the fact that our point still stands on how your side really devalues the status of the people on the ground the most. Therefore, moving on to my substantive and constructive for today's debate. Firstly, on crippling the future growth of society, in which I'll be tackling two aspects, firstly on the economic aspect and secondly on the political aspect. So firstly, on the economic aspect. Now with austerity, GDP shrinks and therefore the revenue collected through the taxes are minimal. Therefore the money collected is not enough to reduce a government's budget deficit in their scenario. Therefore the governments then move on to cutting down resources that were once allocated to essential services such as to spur or sustain economic growth like improving infrastructure, education or transportation. Therefore, in turn, they hamper the further future economic growth because how when, they, when these essential services are cut, there are no more investments going on, they deteriorate. Such as in Spain, where 1.5 billion euro cut, a budget cut was on education that led to 25,000 teacher layoffs and 300 schools closing down. This extends on the very fact that they are then unable to invest in building a more efficient workforce, which means austerity compromises all the factors of production that are crucial to a country's competitiveness in society. This impedes on the future growth as they don't develop their own domestic industry and thus fail to attract any more foreign investments in the future. So on the second aspect, on the political sphere, in which I'll be dealing with two layers in today's debate. Firstly, on the continuous change of governments and how it destabilizes politics. Now with austerity, it means that you implement harsh measures onto your people. So because the nature of these measures are so harsh on the people, it generates resentment and emotional and intellectual distance from the problems. The people then want to elect a new government or force on the current party a resignation because they want to change to their uncomfortable, they want to change in the uncomfortable situation as soon as possible. So on the, uh, on the extreme cases, we have governments that are unable to complete the full terms, such as in the case of Iceland, where there was public discontentment with the situation on the ground, therefore they pushed for early uh, elections and therefore governments were pushed out of their seats. 
And in the most mildest scenarios, when they are able to fulfill their terms, it is just too short for them to equip them with the time needed to implement measures that will really sustain a long-term reformative process. Therefore, it hence destabilizes the political scene and austerity deprives the government the necessary benefits or the necessary stability to, benefit, uh, to provide policies beneficial for the public, both for now and for the future. In the end, also harming the economy because it deters investors due to the uncertainty of the economy of the country. On the second layer on how we allow the rise of right-wing extremists, in a scenario where austerity is so harsh, it causes people to live in a constant fear and duress, where they fear for the uncertainty of sustaining their own livelihoods. This slowly wears people down in society, therefore increasing the probability of, of them becoming open to illogical, radicalized ideas. And we already saw this in the case of, of, of Greece, where the Golden Dawn Party managed to secure a significant number of seats in Parliament, even though they committed and carried, or carried out racist attacks on Jews as the real culprit for poor economic performance in 2012 alone. Therefore, to gain traction in society, these radicalized groups will be pushing for concepts such as breaking apart the EU because they see this in the face of austerity is the only way to guard the severity. Therefore, this then undermines the EU and causes schisms in the basic foundations of the EU and the European dream. Therefore, because austerity is a one-size-fits-all straitjacket, unable to cater to every different need of everyone in the European system, Europe is better off without posterity. Okay, I thank the speaker for her speech and call on the second speaker from the uh, the. Uh, Sab of Vampires, I'm trying to remember which mythical creature I has assigned. Uh, we now have Tudor. Ladies and gentlemen, the only thing the Terminators are going to terminate today through their policy are the future prospects of development of countries like Greece, of Spain, and of Italy if they do not implement austerity measures in the crisis situations today. We tell you that when you have countries that are getting poorer and poorer by the day because of it irrationally spending their money or their money that actually they do not have on profligacy projects, we believe that it, that it is the time, high time for them to cut their coat according to their cloth and to implement austerity measures using the resources they have and not go uh, on these spending streets. Now, in my speech today, I'm going to have several points. First of all, on, on, in what concerns rebuttal, I'm going to have five points of rebuttal and then go into my own substantive, which concerns the way austerity actually has to be applied and that even if up until now austerity has not been applied as it should be, it can be adapted and the principle behind it still stays, but this measure can be adapted. Now, going on to my own substantive. First uh, so, sorry, a rebuttal. Uh, on the first point of rebuttal, on this whole idea that team opposition has brought, team opposition has brought to us today on their measure to tackle this problem, and we tell you that they have actually have given us no viable solution to the situation at hand today in Europe. Why is that? Because they've told us actually their solution is regulating abuse. Ladies and gentlemen, that is no solution. That is a preventative measure. That is a measure that you can take to prevent a situation that uh, that a situation gets worse. But ladies and gentlemen, we are already in that bad situation. These preventative measures should have been applied before the 2008 crisis. We believe they can be applied today. They should be applied, but they are complementary to austerity measures because we believe we should also cure the harm that has already been done by the excessive governmental spending in the world today. Now, we have already told you upon the negative impacts of this huge governmental spending. No, thank you, madam. We have already told you about the raising interest rates, the uh, way in which these uh, countries cannot uh, pay their loans and lose the trust of, uh, of their creditors, thus leading them without austerity measures to a collapse of their systems through which they pay salaries, pensions, and public services. Don't let Team Up Proposition trick you today, telling you it was actually banks who did the two uh, that uh, created the problem. It was governments through their excessive spending, through their profligacy projects, and extreme spending in places such as Greece. Second point of rebuttal. On this whole idea of um 
uh, social effects and how austerity is so negative for uh, for the poor uh, class of the society and the healthcare system and the educational system. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not defend what they call the blunt axe method of austerity today. No, ladies and gentlemen, we do not defend. No, thank you, madam. We do not defend irrationally cutting healthcare, education, and so on. We have already told you that there are accurate methods of using austerity. Uh, pointing into, for example, sectors such as wealthy individuals, taxing them more, abandoning prof legacy projects such as the 2004 Olympics were. We do not believe you have to tackle uh, the, uh, these essential parts of, our, of the society in order to apply these methods. More on that in my uh, in my own substantive. But moreover, moreover, we tell you that it is essential even if we would uh, apply some of these methods also on defavorized communities such as the pure communities. We are willing to see them suffer for a short period of time in, uh, in order to prevent the massive negative consequences of not applying austerity measures. No, thank you, sir. If we do not apply them, Irina has already told you about the collapse of the systems uh, such as, the, uh, such as the, the possibility of paying salaries and of paying pensions because we lose the of foreign investors, first of all, and of our creditors. Now going on to my third point of rebuttal. On this whole idea brought by second proposition, that austerity takes away the stability of governments and that uh, it creates a place for populist no, parties and so on. No, thank you, sir. Well, on the idea of taking away the stability of governments, that has already been taken away by a huge economic crisis, ladies and gentlemen. Already governments are not stable. That is essential to understand. It's already in the state of spoke. The question is what measure could we implement uh, in this moment to deal with this? And we remind you that Team Proposition has brought, I'll take you in a moment, has brought no alternative in today's debate to deal with this. Moreover, we tell you on the rise of these populist parties such as Syriza, such as Podemos, that they have already, even if they have said at the start that they do not accept austerity, after talks with the IMF, after talks with the European Commission, Syriza, for example, has agreed that it needs to implement austerity projects. These parties understand after they talk with their creditors that they have lost the, uh, the, uh, the trust of these creditors and that they cannot support this abusive policy and that they have to implement this, these rational methods of spending. Yes. In the UK, due to austerity measures being implemented in 2008, 3.7 million disabled citizens weren't able to get support from the government because their essential services were cut. Okay, we won't cut the services from disabled people. That is not the point today. We're not defending cutting thousands of uh, help for disabled people. I'll be going on to my own substantive on, on what we exactly will cut and what exactly how we will adapt our austerity measures. But uh, going on to my last point of rebuttal. On the third point, on the impact of the EU. And we've heard quite a bit from a team opposition on this point. But we tell you, ladies and gentlemen, but that leaving these countries, such as Greece, such as these Mediterranean countries, in the current state has negative impacts in, uh, upon the EU also. We see that an eventual exit of Greece from the Eurozone would have a domino effect upon other countries in the EU precisely because it would profoundly affect, no thank you, profoundly affect the trade they have with them and profoundly affect them on a negative level other agents included. And on my last point of rebuttal, on trust in investors. We have already told you that, uh, that uh, not applying austerity measures means continuing raising these interest rates through the these those that these countries cannot currently pay. Moreover, we told you that you will lose the uh, trust of these creditors in order for them to give you the money you need to pay uh, the people in your country, leading to even more, more further damage on a long term. And for, on the third point, we tell you that for the private sector, it is especially negative not to implement these austerity measures. Because in the moment in which Syriza won in, in Greece and told, uh, uh, and told everybody that they will not implement austerity measures, we see that two billion uh, euros in capital has have a, fl a flat f have a left to Greece precisely because private institutions did not want to invest there. No, thank you, madam. Going on to my own substantive. In what sense how these um, how these um, austerity policies should not be abandoned but adapted. We do not defend how they have been used abusively up until now, but we propose that they are adapted. How is that? We tell you that we will not target the most poor and the most uh, the most essential systems such as healthcare. We tell you that, for example, we we can impose wealth taxes. We see that, for example, uh, um, um, tax. Uh, 
the tax levies of 1% have been put onto assets between $100,000 and $500,000, and that has worked to raise revenue for the government. Moreover, by ending tax extensions for super-rich private educational institutes or religious institutes is another way of this financial discipline we want to impose through this austerity of stopping this abusive spending of money. Moreover, we tell you that uh, another method of imposing this kind of adapted austerity is cutting down on the number of useless commissions and bureaucratic commissions that take up money, especially in places such as Greece, and, uh, and inhibit, inhibit development. Moreover, we tell you that it's about also about cutting down on extravagant projects, such as the Greece Olympics in 2004, that bring no benefit to this country, but actually harm it even further through profligacy spending. Because of all these reasons, ladies and gentlemen, because we would like to live in Team Proposition's utopic world, but they have brought no kind of viable alternative to today to austerity measures we beg of you to propose. speaker for his speech and now I call on the final of the three constructive speakers from the proposition side. Uh, from Team Terminators we have uh, Udva. Side opposition has essentially tried to have their cake and eat it too, because they were content to defend the principle of austerity without actually understanding the political reality of Europe, without actually understanding the incentive structures of government and why they will go after the weak and vulnerable first before going after the wealthy. These are all of the things I'll be flagging out throughout my speech. And bearing this framework in mind, two clashes of the house today. Which side is best for the economy of Europe? Which side is best for the social cohesion of the European dream? So on the first clash, in which side is actually best for the economy of Europe? And here they try to tell us, right in the first substantive, that governments will keep borrowing mindlessly, this will widen the budget deficit and increase interest rates. Right from my first speaker, we already told you that the problem was not government irresponsible spending, but instead the fact that they had to bail out too big to fail banks. We saw this in Ireland, but the Irish government had to bail out the Anglo-Irish bank simply because they were too big to fail. If they allowed this bank to fail, it would have destabilized the entire economy. But even if we agree, even if we agree that government's responsible for the crisis, we tell you austerity measures is not the way to go. Why? Because under austerity measures, governments will cut spending towards the weakest and most vulnerable in society. Why? Because they're the most politically expendable. When you cut spending on pensions, when you cut spending on things such as unemployment benefits, it's very hard for these people to rebel. They're the most politically expendable people, and therefore they'll, not cut, they'll cut spending towards the weakest and most vulnerable society. So your side is not really fun for in solving the fundamental problem of government irresponsible spending, because they're only going to cut spending towards the most vulnerable within society. And here they try to tell us, in the latest substantive, this whole idea about the principle of austerity. We support austerity measures such as taxing the wealthy. But let me tell you something. This is completely unrealistic. Why? Because when a government implements austerity measures, the last person they'll go after is the wealthy. Why? Because the wealthy are the ones who contribute to their campaign funds. The wealthy are the ones who are not politically expendable. Therefore, they do not want to target the wealthy. They go after the poor. Because the poor do not serve any purpose, they are politically expendable. And they also conceded that yes, even if the poor have to suffer, they only suffer for a short period of time. That is simply not true, right? You're poor. You don't have money to upgrade your skills. When you're unemployed, your whole family suffers. So even if it's a short period of time, it's still quite grave for these poor people. Let me give you examples. In Greece, after they implemented austerity measures, 15,000 civil servants were laid off their jobs. 
53, 5.5% of youth Spanish are unemployed. Are you really going to tell these people that don't worry, you're only suffering for a short period of time after you implement austerity, everything will be over? I'm sorry, you simply cannot do that. You simply cannot treat the weakest and most vulnerable in society in that manner. So therefore, they cannot simply keep defending the principle of austerity without understanding the political hierarchy of Europe, without understanding the incentive structures of governments. We challenge the next speaker to reconcile these contradictions. Then they also told us this funny point, that now under austerity you can pay off your debt to reassure creditors, right? But this is actually contradicted by the third speaker. Because the third speaker agreed that if Greece leaves the EU, then this will lead to a domino effect. Therefore the EU wants to keep Greece, the EU wants to keep Greece within the monetary union. So this actually means that even if Greece abandons the austerity measures, the EU will do everything it can to keep Greece within the European Union. Why? Because the European dream still means something now, ladies and gentlemen. Simply because we are undergoing a crisis does not mean the European dream has been tarnished, the European dream has been splintered. And on a practical level, if Greece does leave the European Union, there will be systematic consequences for the rest of the European Union. And therefore, even if Greece abandons austerity measures, the ECB will not be happy about it, but they will still continue loading Greece money. And on the comparative, what did we tell you? When you actually abandon austerity measures, the political and social situation within the country becomes better. People start spending more. When you only target your reforms towards the institutions that need the most, for example, your banks, through banking reforms, through strengthening financial regulation, then you're not harming all the weakest and most vulnerable in society. And that is when investors will come and flood your money with, econ with, flood your economy with money, because now you're not targeting everyone with the blunt acts, but you're only targeting the problematic areas. Therefore, on our side, investors are further investing money into the economy. No thank you, sir. Then you'll, and then let me give you an example. After Greece implemented austerity measures, in 2011 alone, $80 billion were pulled out of Greece banks simply because investors didn't see any incentive in investing within these economies. So their own what example works against them. And that's what we told you right from our first substance. That is actually the banking crisis that led to the Eurozone crisis. And therefore, we should target all of our reforms at these problematic areas instead of having a blunt axe and chopping and spending, and chopping everything spending. And what is their response to this? Corruption in Greece was the problem. So a simple question, if corruption was the problem, then how is your austerity helping? Because austerity is cutting spending towards the weakest and most vulnerable society. So how is your austerity helping resolve this whole idea of corruption? And before I move on, yes sir. So how exactly are those poor people, as you say, political and negligible, don't they vote in elections? Can they take out the government and vote on a party like Sirita? Aren't they an incentive enough to don't die? Thank you sir, thank you sir. Uh, let me tell you why they're politically expendable. Because elections only happen once every five years. So in a short-term situation, the government sees, okay, I need to either cut spending towards the rich or you need not cut, cut spending towards the poor. They will cut spending towards the poor. Why? Because they are politically expendable. They do not can contribute to their campaign funds and things like that. They are less likely to tax the wealthy. Why? Because in the Eurozone crisis, you want your wealthy to stay within the country. You want your wealthy to stay and set up businesses within the country. So therefore, on a comparative, you are rather going to go after the poor and most vulnerable in society, such as the disabled people, rather than going after the wealthy who are actually going to help you resolve this crisis. And therefore, we also told you that their side has nothing to resolve this whole idea of corruption. Then they also gave us this funny example of Germany, right? How these things are not happening under Germany. But tell me something. When did Germany actually implement austerity measures in the first place? The reason why all of these problems are not occurring in Germany is because they did not implement austerity measures. They instead implemented things such as fiscal and monetary stimulus and instead targeted their reforms towards the most problematic areas within the economy, which is what our side has been suggesting right from first speaker. Their own example works against them. Then we also told you, my second speaker, this whole idea that now if you harm the short term, your long term structural reforms are mitigated. And this is something they never really tackled, right? Because now if you actually go after education budgets, if you actually go to things like R&D budgets, even the long term structural reforms that they want to implement under their side, the effects will be heavily mitigated. Why? Because if you cut out your education budget, MNCs are less likely to invest in your country because you do not have an educated workforce anymore. If you implement austerity measures, there's a huge brain drain in your country. And that is when MNCs are less likely to invest in your economy because there's a shrinking consumer market. For example, we saw this in Latvia, where 10% of the population left the country after they implemented austerity measures in search of better job opportunities. Then we also told you in my first speaker this whole idea about how collective responsibility, how, not, how we cannot leave certain economies to hang out and dry, and how the entire European Union needs to maintain this collective responsibility. Again, dropped by the entire side. Because what we told you right now, ladies and gentlemen, is through treaties such as the Merchant Treaty, every European economy actually agreed that they are going to uphold to certain fiscal standards. They never actually uphold, uh, they never actually agreed to these fiscal standards, and once things started going bad, they only went after the weakest and most vulnerable economies, countries such as Germany, completely absorbed themselves 
of blame. And he also told you how it's immoral to punish people who have done nothing to contribute to the crisis. Because he told you it's your banks who contributed to the crisis, it's your previous governments through weak financial regulation who contributed to the crisis, and therefore in the status quo, why are you punishing the weakest and most vulnerable within society because of actions done by previous governments, by previous people? Again, no response. Then he also told you how it's undemocratic, how a group of bureaucrats sitting in Frank's Frankfurt and Brussels are now infringing on the European dream and now telling you what to do, are holding the fates of millions of people in their, in their hands. And again, their response was, they have a right to do so. I am sorry, they have no right to do so because they're going against the will of the people, they're going against democratic processes if they're imposing their own austerity measures on, upon these countries. And therefore, we take, they have no right to do so. And let's take this further, right? Because they actually impose things on people. Then actually, obviously, these people will not actually agree with it. They will actually revert back to monetary and fiscal stimulus, which is what we saw in Greece, right? When they imposed these things on Greece, Greece simply voted Cyrenia into power. They simply do not agree with these austerity measures, and therefore, this leads to a long term process of suffering and pain. Because we showed you, we are best for the social cohesion of Europe, and because we are best for the economy of Europe, because we target all our reforms at the problematic areas instead of hurting the weakest and most vulnerable in society, I'm very proud to propose. speaker for his speech, and now call on the third speaker from the opposition side, from Team Sala, we've got Sonia. Greece 
allegedly implemented austerity. Government spending has increased in most of these countries who have allegedly undergone austerity in the past few years. We don't see how the, the, the examples they've brought are really relevant since we don't have the main, the main component of austerity going on in those countries. They, no, thank you. The only, the only damage and the only harm of austerity they've identified in this debate is the one related to targeting the poor and targeting public services, which will uh, leave these countries uh, even poorer with many unemployed people and so forth. Well, we tell you that this these measures haven't even been implemented, haven't even gone to be implemented in most countries. We believe that the countries who are the best examples of efficient austerity haven't gone for this kind of measures, but instead have tried to raise revenues, and no thank you, and, uh, and implement better measures, which, which we've already talked about in our alternatives point. People in Greece have started pro protesting before even having their salaries cut, before even reducing bureaucracy, before even reducing government spending. We don't see how that's re relevant to today's debate, since we've already told you that that's not the kind of austerity we're proposing. The second point I want to make is about this. Point of information, uh, but before I go on, sure, Matt. We say that on your side with austerity measures, it proposes a monolithic view, which doesn't apply to Europe because of the very scenario that we have mature economies and young economies in Europe alone. Well, we do have mature economies and young economies, but we don't think that any of these economies should go into reckless spending at any time of this kind of development, economic development. We don't see how that's really, that uh, differentiation is really relevant. I want to talk about the abstract alternative of regulating the financial system, which we've heard from Tim Proposition. They keep claiming that we need to uh, target the root cause of the financial crisis in 2008. Perfectly all right. If you want to do that, please do. But also, please respond to the problem we have right now, which is excessive national debts on, on the account of most European countries and no money to spend in the future. Please target that kind, uh, that kind of measure in order, to, uh, uh, in order to propose an alternative to the austerity measures uh, in this debate. Huge debt and economic inefficiency, no thank you sir, of countries in Europe right now is our problem and we see how austerity can be the solution if implemented uh, uh, effectively even in countries such as Greece, Italy and Spain. Moreover, they've told us that governments uh, don't go after the rich because they are the ones who contribute to the campaigns of politicians and they are the ones who actually fund the governments. First of all, we tell you that's a huge speculation. That's a huge misportrayal of what countries in Europe look like. We have countries such as Germany, again, Baltic states, and so on. Even if it were true that governments are less likely to target the rich, we believe that that's exactly what we need to change. That's what we're proposing through the kind of austerity we're, we're, we're talking about today. That's the, kind, the, uh, the clientelism of governments such as, uh, such as the one in Greece and Italy and Spain is what we want to get rid of in order to have economic efficiency and economic growth. We don't want favoritism anymore at the level of business investment and so on. Well, That's exactly uh, what, uh, what we need to uh, get rid of. No, thank you. Because we've also explained to you that we have two types of countries in Europe. We have countries in which austerity has had results and because it has been well implemented, and uh, countries in which austerity has been, uh, we've had uh, tries at austerity which haven't really worked. But in these countries, these tries have also been accumulated with other factors that have slowed down this process. They, this uh, this uh, austerity has been accumulated with corruption, with reckless spending in all sorts of sectors, all sorts of commissions that we've been talking about in this debate, with tax evasion, like no thank you, with and with and with other uh, spending, with other reckless spending of governments, which has made it impossible, almost impossible, for austerity to work in uh, all of these countries. Before I move on, if there's any POI. Okay, so because at, because at the end of, uh, at the end of this debate, we've heard about a context, a context of countries in Europe which need a solution right now for the problems they're going through. We don't need a solution for how to regulate banks, and that's not even mutually exclusive with, with what we want to have implement in this debate. We don't have enough money, and we need to show creditors that we can spend the money in a very reasonable manner, in a manner that will sustain economies over years, uh, uh, over years in Europe. What we've heard from the proposition is only reasons not to implement bad austerity. 
is the only reason not to implement reckless austerity, which indeed targets the poor and targets public services. What you've, you've heard on team opposition is what really being a uh, uh, being a rational, rational with your uh, finances and what really being rational with your resources is and that's exactly how Europe's, economy, uh, Europe's economies should look in the future. Because of all these reasons, it's because we've had no real alternative from the proposition, please uh, impose austerity even further. Thank you. I thank the speaker for her speech and now invite Arima to return and reply on behalf of her team. In the vampire debating textbooks that we have in Romania, there is this one important rule that proposition has to propose something. The terminators have been telling us these two very abstract things financial supervision and better negotiating. We've been asking them several questions. Firstly, and the most important one, is what is that? If we were to go out on the street and implement what proposition is telling us, what would we do specifically? Because Greece would be very pleased to hear that that would pretty much be nothing because at the point of this debate, we still don't know what proposition wants to do with the budget deficit problem that they have considered to all throughout this debate. Second of all, we've been asking them, okay, prevention is fine, we don't want another economic crisis, but what do we do now? Now we have a budget deficit. How is this budget deficit gonna be solved by better negotiating, by better bailouts? by financial supervision. Who is going to do that? How are we going to solve the problem that team proposition has considered to? In this case, the, the type of doubt that opposition has cast is more than reasonable because we still don't have a clear outlook on how are we going to solve this problem. The debate is happening now, not in debate fairy tale land. And the debate is happening in real life, not in textbooks, in Europe, which doesn't pretty much have an alternative to this. Saying speculations like people will spend more, financial foreign investors will come to these countries. We believe that that's highly false with no empirical basis whatsoever. So we stand by the fact that in the absence of a proven alternative of a kind of model that team proposition has to give us today, we believe that austerity measures, if correctly implemented, are the best way to do this. Now, team proposition has based almost their entire case on this argument called immorality. It's funny that they chose such a relative term to define austerity because we seem to have different definition of what morality is. Opposition believes that immorality is borrowing with no future prospect of ever returning those money. Immorality is dismissing sky-high debt, refusing to do anything about excessive, unnecessary spending that is what puts these countries in an impossibility to repay this debt. What the proposition told us is that apparently immorality is financial institutions not having any right to impose austerity on countries. As somebody who wants to study law and actually values the norms that we have in society, I think that's pretty much absurd. Saying that they have no moral basis to impose something on these countries in a basis of a contract that these countries willingly sign with financial institutions is just false. If you as a European country decided to strike a deal and receive a bailout, then you are responsible to ensure that you have a, a future possibility of repaying those money, that you are responsible enough for your creditors to give those money back. What Team Proposition is doing is actually making these countries irresponsible in a situation in which the, the, the money that they, bought, they borrowed is unreplaceable. We are not here to defend abuses. We are not here to defend extreme poverty and extreme unemployment. 
We are here to defend what Germany did, what Finland did, what Latvia did, which is correct austerity. Because if you look at the principle behind austerity, you will see discipline. You will see the realization that spending too much, especially in the times of crisis, especially when you have a duty towards other people, is simply wrong. Thank you. Speaker for her speech, and I call on the final speaker of her team of this debate and of this competition. Uh, I call on Esther. that happened 20 years ago. Immoral is when you choose to ignore the real harms that occur on the ground by simply dismissing it on your side. But let's look at the approach, the main approach that side opposition chose to take today. Essentially what they were saying in all three speakers was firstly, if austerity manages to work, if everyone implements it in society, and when a country managed, manages to implement it properly all based on the fact that austerity has not worked at all till status quo, and yet they're still going to try to keep doing it, completely dismissing the fact that austerity has its flaws. They pushed for it as a logical decision to make because it was textbook ideal situation, but we showed you how when you apply it to reality, it's simply not going to turn out the way you would like it to, and they chose to dismiss it on the whole. So the main approach that they were going for was that principally it was good and practically it was bad. And we defeated that both on our grounds already. First, on how principally it was good, we tackled it by showing you that no, it wasn't principally good because practically when you enact it in society, you harm the people that needed the help the most and you harm the people that weren't supposed to be held accountable for something that didn't really happen because of them. Practically, we showed you how it wouldn't work out at all because increasing investor confidence wouldn't even occur on your side because with austerity, you stunt economic growth, whereas on our side, we equip it to keep on moving, we mobilize society and economic success. Therefore, they kept pushing us for the reply on whether, economic, whether we had a plan to solve economic crisis today because it's happening now and not something of a preemptive measure. And we already gave you so many different alternatives on our side to fix the solutions today, in which we had solutions like debt restructuring, reforms on banking loans, and etc. All these things that were out of the realm of austerity, something that was imposed, something that had no cooperation with from the government themselves. And that was so problematic from the very start because we highlighted to you the specificity of the European nations in general on how they have a range of mature governments and mature economies and younger economies. So today we have two main clashes on firstly who solves the main problem existent in Europe and secondly on who protects the people of Europe the most. And on the first point, when they told us austerity is effective means because it instills discipline and restriction, that's a very nice way that they chose to paint something that really meant losses and harms to the people on the ground. It means that we take away the essential services of the people. And instead, you blame the most innocent and you don't solve anything with austerity. They also say that credibility can only be incurred and can only occur when austerity takes place. No, you don't increase credibility, you don't attract investors with um, austerity anymore because you cut infrastructure, you cut essential services, and etc. And we gave you tangible examples of how it already happened in Portugal, Ireland, and Spain. We saw all these, cu uh, we saw all these cuts in infrastructure harming the economic development of society. Therefore, no foreign investments come in, your economic growth is stunted, credibility will slowly dissipate in your situation. Therefore, we showed you that we can only solve the situation at hand when we let them tailor the situations for themselves because of the different economic st uh, standards in Europe that exist today. Therefore, because we understood the real ideals of how the Europe system works, we better dealt with it. So the last point, who better protected the people in Europe? 
The main stance they took to this was mainly saying that they didn't and wouldn't do it in the first place, although we gave you tangible results of how it would in the first place. Therefore, they've never come back to us properly, showing us how they would stop and protect the people, when with austerity measures, it's inevitable that this would occur. Therefore, because we've likened austerity to something that is ineffective and restrictive and only harms the people that shouldn't be harmed in the first place, we are proud to propose. Over. Let us say one more time.